to the Creators Assemble Talk LGBTQIA Q&A Representation and Trendsetting in Comics. I am Moni Barrett. I am a comics librarian and the co-founder of Creators Assemble Inc., which is a nonprofit that raises awareness of the value of comics and pop culture and education. We provide support to educators who want to use these materials in educational settings and facilitate connections and resources to help creators find professional opportunities in this space. But more importantly, we have our guests here today, Tina Horn and Grace Ellis, to talk to us about representation in comics and what the trends are going to be and what's next for the profession and so on. So I'd like to give you both a chance to introduce yourselves. Tell us uh, what, how, where the audience might know you from and anything else. If there's, if there's some kind of semi-personal silly thing you want to say, let us know. Starting with Grace, you want to go first? Wow. I was going to, I was going to offer to throw it to Tina first. You are. <laughs> <laughs> <the hot> <laughs> <plate>. <laughs> <Light>. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Grace Ellis. Uh, I brought, I have, I have my books as well. Um, so I, you might recognize me from Lumberjanes, the writer and co-creator of Lumberjanes or Moonstruck from Image Comics. I've also done some work for DC, including a Batwoman story that's running digitally right now and will be released physically probably oh. by the time you see this. Um, but it's very fun, very gay. My The fun fact that I always like to throw out is that um, I, a couple years ago, saw 10 different productions of high, from high schools only doing Mamma Mia. Oh, how fun. So that that's feels a good way to spend time. If, if I, I agree. Um, and I feel like that pretty much sums up everything about me. <laughs> that's all we needed to know. There you go. Take that, Christine Baranski. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and Tina, that's a hard act to follow. What about you? Um, okay, so I am the writer creator of Safe Sex, um, which you can usually find by searching for SFSX. And um, this is a first book. Uh, it came out uh, in 2019 from Image Comics, and we are hard at work on the second volume. Oh, this one is called Safe Sex Protection. Uh, and we're hard at work in the second volume, which is called safe sex terms of service. Incidentally, maybe probably not coincidentally, um, the editor and designer of my book is also the editor and designer of Grace's book, Moonstruck, so yes. with Lauren McCoven. Um, so Lauren is like the fairy godmother of like queer comics from like YA all the way through to triple X. Yes. <laughs> very, very versatile and like wonderful and I like wouldn't be who I am today in so many ways if it wasn't for McCubbin yes. so she is the shout out that is holding us together so thank absolutely you. thank you Lauren this is yeah. really this panel is just dedicated. this is actually the Lauren McCubbin tribute yeah. panel yeah no, you know that's um, awesome um my my partner had recommended that I ask a question like that I was like I don't know if it'll be too personal to name names of who's helped you in the industry but you jumped right in so there you go that's totally. awesome. I mean, I always feel like if somebody helps me, that like helps open doors and like helps me to like build community and networking, if I can then get them a job um, and if I can like get them paid uh, doing something that they want to do, then that's like the dream. So um, that's, so then I can name names because the name is right there on the cover of the book. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I fully that's agree. Awesome. And um, did you have and a silly then, fact? Um, I don't know about silly facts. I was gonna like um, spew off some of the other stuff that I do. I, I um, produce and host a, an indie podcast called Why Are People Into That? That is about sex, kink, gender, and love. That is a very, very queer podcast um, by and for queers and people who love us. Um, and I also have been doing more in the past few years. I've always done... Um, consulting in various forms um but I've been doing more on-set intimacy consulting for film and television and theater including a off-Broadway genderqueer production of Streetcar Named Desire and um pre-COVID also pre-COVID I was on set as both the intimacy well not the intimacy coordinator technically but the um BDSM and sex work tech coordinator for the 
dominatrix scenes in the second season of Pose, um, which okay. is maybe not silly, but like definitely like all time great awesome. gigs that that yeah. I've had. Um, and I do a lot of I, I do a lot of um, like workshops and education on BDSM and uh, both like like how to's, but then also like education about about cultures and uh, queer identities and a lot of work in the sex worker rights movement in general and like movement organizing. So none of that is silly. What's Very, silly about that's cool. definitely not silly, but to not like turn this panel into just like, let me ask you so many questions about so many different elements of that. It's so cool. It's so interesting. Well, we're just going to have to hang out in person ASAP. Oh, I'm fully oh. vexed. I've got the, the Dolly Parton merchandise, AKA oh, the well. yes. Jerno vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, sorry. Um, I took a nap and totally slept through my alarm. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> naps are so important. Na- naps are essential. Yes. yes. Your timing you are is actually, your timing's yeah. perfect. perfect. Oh, We're doing good. introductions, including where we would know you from and uh, anything that you want the audience to know, whether it be a silly fact or a fascinating fact, as Tina gave us. Uh, where people would know me from. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. Um, yeah. Uh, and I guess, uh, did you say a fun fact? Yeah. Um, I am a identical triplet. Really? Yeah. And stylized wise, like, do you all wear your hair the same? Do you all wear, like, do you all kind of... Uh, that, so what's interesting about that is, uh, I found out maybe, I don't know, eight years ago. Um, I lived by myself for the first year of my life. Uh, I'm also an adoptee. So uh, the three of us were adopted after a year old, but uh, they lived together uh, and I was by myself. So they look very much the same mm-hmm. hairstyle. They, they like looking the same, which I think is weird. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like multiples who like to look exactly the same I think should be classified as mental illness but that's just, <laughs> I've always or been like, like parent and... trap they've got like a parent yeah. trap scam going on basically like kudos to them. yeah exactly so they don't have long hair they have short hair they have uh kind of matching tattoos they yeah they it's yeah so they look very much alike it's quite the commitment yeah so what books have you done in the past just to kind of familiarize the audience with you um, so I, I did a, uh, several books with Insight C- Comics, um, Skip to the End, Skinned, uh, Before Houdini and After Houdini. And my first publication was Southern Dog through Action Lab. And my most recent publication is Made in Korea through Image Comics. I came out last week. Perfect. Well, thank you for being here today. So now we have the whole crew. So I would like you all to share with us, um, taking turns, or if you're not comfortable answering, that's cool too. But one of your most memorable successes and what you learned from it about finding and using your voice. You want to start? <laughs> um, I, I guess- no, oh God, you start. I hate uh, you yeah, start. <laughs> uh, so, so for me, I guess uh, a, a success and what I learned from it was, um, uh, so I had a comic book that came out last summer, a graphic novel through Comicsology Originals called Virtually Yours, which is my homage to the rom-com genre. I love rom-coms. I love the, the tropes. I love the, the stories. Uh, and I wanted to tell my own, but the story that actually got published wasn't the version that, that uh, originally conceived. So the version that is out now is, um, a version of New York City that I love. It features a POC cast uh, and LGBTQ characters. And um, when I originally wrote it, it was all white people. And I have been writing up until 2017, I was writing all white male savior stories. And I understand why I did this. So when I uh, came out as non-binary in 2017, I realized that writing the white male savior story wasn't working for me anymore and it wasn't my story. So then I went back and looked at all my work that I had written, that I was writing, and I literally infused color. I took out all the whiteness. And that I'm really grateful for because 
um, it forced me to write about my personal narratives and it gave me encouragement. It gave me um, sort of uh, the opportunity to write about that. And so I did. And, and in Virtually Yours, um, there are very personal components of that story that resonated with readers and, and podcast interviewers have interviewed me specifically about components that resonated with them that uh, I lifted from my own life. So um, yeah, that's, that's something that I'm, I'm really uh, proud of. Congratulations, that's awesome. Yeah, that's rad. Tina, you wanna go next? Yeah, um, I think that a moment that I want to highlight is that safe sex was on a tilt-a-whirl of development for a couple of years. And when the first issue came out on Image, and Image has been incredibly supportive to me and this book, um, when the first issue came out on Image, it sold out its first print run um, before it, its release date. And so like ahead of the release date, we it went to second printing and I got to hire one of my best uh, comic book friends, Katie Skelly, whose work is more like drawn in quarterly um, or uh, fantagraphics, I should say, um, uh, indie. Um, so like not quite right for this like kind of more like action adventure story but then I got to hire her to do a variant cover and then you know we had the issue release at Blue Stockings which is a queer and sex worker run uh, collective books are now collectively uh, owned and run um, bookstore in the Lower East Side where I used to you know, when I, when I didn't even live in New York, when I would be visiting New York, I, I would like take my little zines there and like consign them and like make five bucks. And, uh, you know, that's been my, like the most, like my favorite, but also kind of like the most like important bookstore and community space in my whole life. And I'm so glad that they are like growing and thriving through the pandemic. And so this was in the, the old space and they've, they've recently moved, but, you know, just like seeing like so much of my community being like, uh, I, I, you know, I kind of have my like genre literary fiction and like comic book uh, people. And then I have uh, sort of my more like sex subculture, like leather community people. And like, they all kind of came together. Either they were like, I like would never like read a sexy book or I've never read comic books. And they just like all came together and partied at Blue Stockings and, um, my friend Lindsay Dye, who's a performance artist who specializes in these fetish cake sittings where she like bakes these custom cakes and sits on them while singing, um, like did this like tribute performance. And like, I guess the point of describing all this besides the fact that it was one of the best nights of my life and it was really fun and cool. Um, is just like, I was like, people like it. I told you, like, you better listen to me when I tell you that people are gonna like um and I don't know I guess I I have a lot of like brazen confidence to like do things to DIY things and do it my way but you know you encounter barriers you encounter disappointments you encounter setbacks and um you know despair is like always like nipping at your heels so um to have that moment I, I feel like I return to that moment of like jubilation and like community celebration a lot when I'm feeling like can I keep doing it and it's like yeah like because I gotta give the people what they want and I love that too and Grace <laughs> you two follow-ups Tina what was the name of that shop is blue stockings right blue stockings yeah okay, I just wanted to make sure that it was like very I wrote it down but I want to make sure that everyone like knows what you're talking about um blue stockings, blue stockings. bookstore in New York City and they also have an online store and they're just great great Stocking. folks to follow Wait, and visit and yeah um, okay so I think that you have really tapped into like the whole thing right which is like when you make anything the goal is to like 
make something that people are going to respond to and ideally like bring a community together around that. Mm. Um, before Lumberjanes was released, um, we were releasing it at Emerald City Comic Con and we had no idea like what it was gonna be. There wasn't a lot out there like it at the time. Um, we thought, it, I, I genuinely thought it was just gonna be like a, like a silly little side project. Um, but at the first day at Emerald City, the doors opened and this group of five girls ran over to the table in full cosplay. Um, despite the fact that the book was not out, you could not read this book. Um, so it was just like, they just responded to the cover and they were like, we know for sure that this is going to be something that we love. And I was like, okay, I think that this is like a real thing that people are really responding to. And I think that there is a real hunger for a really wide variety of uh, queer stories. So I'm just very happy that that is the case as someone who likes to write queer stories. <laughs> that's some. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I. That's a, I mean, uh, it's interesting because Tina's story is very much about having the confidence, going full steam ahead, and I think I'm I'm more like you in the sense of, I think I like Maiden Korea. I thought I did a pretty good job, but the fact that it it sold out at, at uh, when it was released and it's going back for a second printing the first issue and nice. it's being so well reviewed, it's like it's not lining up with what I imagined. Like I imagine some people would say, oh, that's pretty good. But I mean, how, how do you uh, reconcile that? Like, wow, this is like something that's really connecting. I don't know. I think that it's mostly just like, I, I am focused on writing what I want. And I mean, I'm sure that like, I will hit on some projects in the future that everyone will be like, we could do without this, but it'll be enough for me, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's I'm, I'm very selfish in that I'm just like, what do I want to write? And that's what I'll do. And then just like hope that I can get it in front of the right people, you know? There's yeah, that, that's awesome. It, it took me so long to stop writing to a theoretical audience, stop writing to a specific editor and just write what I want to write because for me, it felt very counterintuitive to write about things that were important to me because I kind of told myself, well, who cares about my problems? Nobody's going to find that interesting. But when you infuse that authenticity, it, it comes through. And I, and I think people can relate to something that's authentic. And, and oftentimes they can say, oh, that's me too. For sure. Awesome. For sure. That's very insightful. <laughs> So that actually does lead to the next question, which would be one of your biggest challenges, whether it's coming from within, like you're saying, where you sort of question if, if you're gonna find an audience with what you're you know, trying to write. Um, but what have one of your biggest challenges been uh, in the comic space as a member of the LGBTQIA community? Hmm. Um, for me, it's, it, it wasn't so much the LGBTQIA space specifically, um, mm. that space has been super receptive and supportive and, and um, I've been able to speak on panels, which is great. For me, the hardest part was getting into comics as a POC with a very white name. Mm. And I was not part of those conversations. Uh, I was not ever invited to speak about um, being a person of color and uh, it took a lot of just going to conventions and getting stuff published and, and doing interviews and just creating this public persona image, um, whatever you want to call it, that uh, I've been included. And, and, you know, doing books with with a publisher that gets it and understands image has been super supportive. And, and I've been able to, like this very panel, I wouldn't have been able to get on, you know, a year ago, three years ago. So um, I do think it's also important to go with a publisher that not only believes in the work, but believes in the people behind the work. Tina and Grace? What do you think, Tina? Um, something that comes to mind for me is that my work, almost all of my work across many mediums has to do with sex and power and whenever possible, I'm invested in being as 
explicit and adult as possible because that's just like who I am and how I am and what I'm interested in as a as a creator and in, in nonfiction as as well uh, and so investigating uh, the explicit and so like all of my work is is uh, like airs on the side of like how explicit can I be and like I can do work that is not x-rated like if somebody can like draw the parameters of like this is what you can do and this is what you can't do and I'm like that's cool I can show fisting somewhere else and I have and I will continue to um but I've had I've had issues and I won't name any names both because I don't need to like call anybody to the mat and also because part of what I want to talk about is the way that sexual censorship especially sexual censorship of any marginalized identities, particularly queer sexual identities is institutional and like is not just like one bad actor or even like one particular company, but is just like baked into um, the infrastructure of so many things in arts and entertainment. So like there are things that I wanted to show in safe sex volume one protection that apt that are the opposite of gratuitous that are like absolutely about like the characters in our lives and their arcs and their relationships and the plot and the aesthetics and like everything else about it and like everything about the project from the beginning was like this is for mature readers this is for mature readers and I encountered people uh, like uh, I've encountered various people at various uh levels being like okay well you can't show this and I'm like well like but why <laughs> like can you tell me why and nobody can say why because and I feel pretty um uh qualified to say that people feel uncomfortable and they don't want to admit that they're uncomfortable anyway it's a whole big thing and a lot of my work is about also like it, like poking at that and exposing it but like something that I look you know so I would I would like uh go to my comic book shelf and like pick out like books that like publishers had published and been like like okay keep like taking aside the fact that like this person's balls are being like blown off with a shotgun like that you know okay that's that's fine we could show that that's fine but then I would be like so see this is this is sex between people and they would they nobody would be able to like show why that like explain mm -hmm. to me why that was okay but like what I wanted to show in terms of BDSM, in terms of trans and non-binary bodies, in terms of group sex, in terms of like cultural sex, um, uh, in terms of non P and the V sex uh, was like not acceptable. Um, and, you know, I kind of like learning to think because I'm a writer and I'm like learning to think visually. And I really sort of started to identify that there's this kind of like silhouette of like cis het missionary sex that it like as long as it's like obscured by like a you know a, a lamp you know in the like eyes wide shut way or or is like in shadow or there's like mystical swirling like happening around it because it's comics like that that's okay to show and that's not considered a scene because it's kind of like that like silhouette of like a naked babe on the on the like mud flap of a of a car it's like mm -hmm. well that's not a naked body that's like an icon that represents a naked body and so this like particular kind of sex as long as it's like silhouette is not obscene but even if I'm not actually like showing the penetration or I'm not showing nudity like people see representations of sex that they like maybe don't understand or are threatened by um uh and they like don't know how to make it into this like pg-13 like iconic like representation um and then they're like well you just can't we don't even want to figure it out we just you just can't show that um and that is part of how queer people don't see like sex or love or community or culture like represented in their fiction so that's something that I'm really trying to change and again like a lot of the people that I work with now are very supportive of that whether they just are supportive of what like the project that we're trying to do and they trust us or they specifically are like yes let's get more we trust you to put more queer representation out there that like people want to see or don't even know that they want to see until they see it kicking down those doors yes and grace um weirdly i can absolutely relate to that um <laughs> so lumberjanes often classified as a teen book i think that's a little silly um mm. 
it's it's too young. It's too young to be a teen book. And it's classified that way because of the LGBT characters. Moonstruck is a teen book for sure. And the yeah. you, can't, you can't read those two books side by side and tell me that they're the same audience, yeah. you know? Um, I think Image being very supportive has a lot to do with that. And I just want to like really echo like Image is like the place to be. Um, so like basically you're saying that like Lumberjanes just by necessity of being like having queer characters yes. like, is more obscene and more mature absolutely yeah even right. if there's no yeah well, like, even if it's not what's kid. being depicted right yeah um you'll notice that lumberjanes well we are adults um so we probably won't notice but lumberjanes is isn't at book fairs um because of the lgbt characters um uh. and that's just kind of what it's gonna be right now um i don't really know what to do with that except just keep doing what we're doing and saying that that is wrong. I've, <laughs> I went to this um, school one time and this girl had invited me, the student had invited me. Um, and I like walked in the door and she met me there and she was like, hey, this is our librarian, Mrs. Whatever. And she thinks Lumberjanes is a teen book. And then she walked away. So I was like, my introduction to this school was like, please have this argument with my librarian. And I was like, thank you so much. Um, Wow. But that's, I mean, that's like definitely a very particular LGBT issue. Um, the other one that I wanted to say is that um, all three of our books are very, very different. Um, and they're about very, very different things. We're approaching things from very different angles, but they're all LGBTQ books. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really important that there are so many books um, because there's such a wide variety of experiences. And I think that a lot of the times because there aren't a ton of LGBTQ books, um, readers expect every LGBT book to be everything to yeah. every person. Um, and that's just not possible. I mean, the, the queer community is so, it's so varied. Um, that there's just there's just no way that one thing can be everything to every person so you just have to focus on the story that you want to tell and hope that it resonates with people um and do what you can to support everyone else in doing the same in writing their stories um and that yeah. i think that's also like real particular to us yeah i totally agree i i think that with more queer stories it's it, to me it makes me think of queer stories or queer people to me are similar to Asian people where it's viewed as kind of like a monolith and it's like they were just this it, there's a spectrum to everything and this is something I'm realizing as I get older it doesn't matter it's there's spectrums with good things there's spectrums with bad things um recently I've been kind of unpacking this thought of racism being on a spectrum which I've never considered but I think we all have internalized blank doesn't matter what it is because we've been raised in a heteronormative society um and yeah, I think just having more stories exposing the truth that there's so many facets to kind of look at all of this and there's so many opportunities to look at it from a very specific point of view to kind of say, this is one way to look at it. This isn't the only way, but look, there's another way. And they're all kind of looking at this from a different angle, but that it's all informative and inclusive. I just wanted to jump in real quick about challenges. So my background and Jeremy, before he came in, I was a librarian, public librarian for 16 years. And I am the current president elect for ALA's graphic novel and comics Roundtable. Um, so just with that, I've heard a lot of the challenges and been on the front line of a lot of the challenges. And I'll tell you like Lumberjanes specifically, you were absolutely right, Grace, which you already know, but um, trying to get it categorized as like a teen book. And it's like, no, I've read it. It's not a teen book. Like that's, it's not moving. And I like to ask people, like, why, why would you suggest that we move that up? You know, because people aren't usually, usually. And things like, um, I would love, I would love to be in a public library right now because I would, I would buy um, your book, Tina, and put it on the shelf and face it outward. Cause that was the one envelope. I would put it in the adult area, but things like sex criminals, for instance, and actually like face it outward like they do in a bookstore or we had Saga and of course there's a breastfeeding mother on the cover. The kind of challenges for people who haven't even read the books when it's appropriately cataloged and in the adult area is just get with your librarians because we will keep pushing for you. So anyway. Libraries, libraries need the things that 
comic book stores had when I was a kid, which is like the illicit back room with a curtain in oh. front of it <laughs> that you like just you go you go in to like get your pull list of you know in for me in the like 80s and 90s was like superhero and like horror book like I could usually convince them to like you know give me like vertigo books um but that you know it was always like behind that curtain is a whole world of everything that I want and then the minute I was 18 I was like let me in I love that so much yeah but you know you, you hit the nail on the head too Tina talking about how you can show like balls being blown off and that's okay, but two people or a bunch of people doing something consensual, consensual that's gotta be censored. And it is, it's crazy. I mean, not to pick on Deadpool, but for instance, as like a cover, you know, no one said boo when you have a Deadpool cover out front where he's killing zombies or ever what else, but mm. well, you've got a breastfeeding mother and now you're gonna have have words and talk to the mayor's office. So, you know, <laughs> that one, that one's crazy. wild. That one's wild. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So don't even get us on our on our censorship soapbox, right? So uh, I do have a fun question, which is if you could work on any mainstream project that you haven't already worked on, which one would it be and how would you change it? Mm. <laughs> uh, I have a quick one. I've already mentioned Vertigo. I totally grew up on vertigo and uh because i'm a long time uh fan of uh, like in particular that era of comics i know for a fact that john constantine who was created by alan moore and originated in swamp thing is canonically bisexual so i would really 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 love to write a like constantine or swamp thing like hellblazer saga where that like is not just like oh here's like a little gag where Constantine's cool with a threesome it's like no 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 we're gonna we're gonna totally we're gonna go there we're gonna tell the most bisexual like mystic detective story ever told so that's that's my pitch for anyone anyone listening <laughs> you heard it here folks she's available <laughs> I don't think I have anything in particular I think I, I've always wanted to write a jubilee story but I, I haven't kept up with mainstream comics in so long that mm -hmm. I mentioned this to a friend and, and he sent me all this stuff about the current run on jubilee and I, I was like but she's a vampire what she has a daughter who turns into a dragon what like I'm confused <laughs> so that's one does yeah so I don't I don't know I mean uh I, I think I would like to take I don't know. I, I liked that, you know, I think it was Greg Pak who did um, an Asian Hulk. I mean, it's like, that would be cool, stuff like that. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, like, uh, I heard recently that Todd McFarlane is doing this interconnected universe with his Spawn books. And I, I think that's really cool. I think that's doing what the mainstream comics did to become mainstream. Mm -hmm. And I think that the character of Spawn and that whole universe is for me, as someone who is a, a transracial adoptee, who has, you know, very deep rooted identity conflicts, um, taking on a character, building a character, up, you know, from the ground up within that universe would be really cool. Um, so yeah, that's something I've been thinking about recently. That's a much more thoughtful than the answer I was going to give. Um, <laughs> have fun with it. So I. I have a, I always have a list of like things I would like to adapt. Um, and I think the like most ambitious thing on that list is I would love to get my hands on Red Dead Redemption. Any, anything they want, I, I would do it. I would do it. I would drop everything to do that. Um, and that will never happen. And one of the reasons that will never happen is because it is impossible to imagine them giving the project to a woman. It's impossible mm. for me to imagine them doing that. Just because like the community of people that play that game and are like invested in those characters would say no immediately to it. Um, but I, I have so many ideas. I think it's such a rich world and such a rich universe. Ah, I love Red Dead Redemption. It's so good. Oh my God. <laughs> So to kind of piggyback off what you just said, Grace, I actually am writing, I've been writing and my, my, my agent's been, has the, the pitch out on submission, but I, I basically took uh, 
The Great Gatsby and I contemporized it. I infused an entire POC cast with, you know, an LGBTQ twist to the romance um, because I read Gatsby a couple years ago and I just thought of a, of a modern YA retelling of it. Um, and so that's- Oh my God, is he a tech bro? He, so the, the Gatsby character is, I don't know, this might be a bit, bit of a spoiler. <laughs> I've, I've kept the relationships intact. I've, I've altered some things. So like the, the gas station attendant and his wife, I think Myrtle in the book, um, I've changed that relationship to be a brother and sister because it's a younger character. So the, the brother actually is a high ranking member of MS-13. So there's a gang component to it because there is a, a serious stronghold of MS-13 gang members in Long Island. Um, and the Gatsby character does have a social media company that they believe is where his fortune comes from, but he actually has something else. I've made him a modern day bootlegger. Um, so I'll kind of leave that vague, but um, you know, the, the Nick Carey character is um, a Chinese uh, citizen who's coming from Singapore to stay with his Chinese American cousin in Long Island to acclimate to the American lifestyle before he goes off to Columbia in the fall. So he's not used to this opulent wealth that his uh, American cousin uh, has lived with him. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm just kind of taking all the things I liked about the source material and updating it, making it interesting to me. That's awesome. Two <laughs> tickets, please. Yeah, yeah definitely. All of all my money. <laughs> and if you make that clear what, it, what it's supposed to be like on the cover or somewhere in the marketing, you take all the librarians and teachers money too, because that's one of the number one things we get asked for is adaptations of Gatsby. So. Yeah. I'm yeah. surprised that um, I, I, I saw that there was a publisher that has done a direct adaptation. I, I think, I think it was Simon and Schuster. Someone else did a direct adaptation last year. And I, I, I look at these books and I go, but why? Like we yeah. know what this, why do we need a graphic novel version of this? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think the cover would be, would be the biggest hurdle uh, for me right now. Cause I, uh, I've, I've talked about a cover idea with, with uh, my, my co-creator, but um, I think I want to kind of go design heavy with it. So I've been talking about it with my book designer and just because we are in the twenties and I think it could be an interesting way to kind of bring that back. Um, but I don't want to like try to remix uh, that, that, uh, that style, but maybe just, you know, respect it and pay, pay homage to it. But um, yeah, I just think it would be really cool. And I, I did read in USA Today when one domain that the great, great, great granddaughter of Fitzgerald wanted to see someone take the story and, and feature POC characters. And I was just like, I sent that to my agent. I said, I'm doing this, we're doing it. <laughs> you so. get their endorsement. That's huge. Yeah, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. So we're wrapping up with the last few questions here, but what can folks outside of the LGBTQIH community or non-POC folks do to be true advocates? And what's something you wish that everyone knew? Just give us your money. <laughs> Peel it off. I love it. Yeah, money, money, resources, jobs, gigs. And then, and then like, listen to us when we're like, also, you should hire this person. Love that's it. what we need. I don't know about you guys. That's what I need. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to recommend picking up books, our books at um, the library. Um, it, Cause it feels like cheating because you're not paying for it, but we are getting paid for those books. Mm -hmm. um, so the burden isn't entirely on you. You can, you can also read it at the library and recommend it to your friends. And that totally counts. Totally. Yeah, I think to kind of, you know, uh, tag, tag onto that is just taking chances on, on stuff that you would normally read. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the thing I've noticed, the consensus through the reviews for Made in Korea is that nobody knows any of the creative people on the book, which was enough for them to not care about it. But then they read it and they were quite surprised by the story. And, uh, you know, that, that's, I mean, just take a chance. Don't, don't get so, you know, I, I get it because some people have a limited income and they can only spend X amount of dollars on, on comics and comics have gotten exceedingly more expensive. 
Um, but I, I think that, you know, it's single issues are really difficult for me because it's, it's hard to kind of promote a book in chapters. Like you can't really say, read this. It's like, well, read the beginning of this. Okay. Um, but at the same time, there is something about doing a, a number one issue that really instantly gets people to want to read it, regardless of what it is. I think if Made in Korea had come out as, as a graphic novel or a trade, I don't think it would have had as many readers, to be honest. Um, so I, I think that, uh, yeah, just, just take a chance on something that you, you look at and go, oh, I don't know what that is, and maybe lead with that, lean into that. Honestly, I feel like we could spend an entire panel just talking about the comics industry and how mm -hmm. like just that part of it, just like how, like how do you make these decisions on how to distribute it and what are the advantages and, dis and disadvantages? The like distribution model in the comics industry is such a nightmare and it really, really works against you in many, many ways. Nobody yeah, like, like explaining the final, quarter, the final order cutoff to, to my family. <laughs> I was just like, eh, forget it. I, I'm, you're not going to understand what, the, and it even sounds weird to explain. It's like someone described it to me once, like, okay, say there's a, a series of movies coming out, like, a, like Lord of the Rings, right? Well, you need to buy the first ticket if you want to see the movie, which makes sense, but you got to buy it in advance. And if you want to see the next one, you got to buy that in advance and the next one after that in advance. So you're buying tickets for something you haven't even seen and you don't know if you're even going to like. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for sure. So actually, you're, you're hitting the nail on, on one of the, the heart of the thing that Creators Assemble does, which is advocate for aspiring creators, help connect them to paying gigs, help connect them to networking opportunities and to one another. So this is a question we asked of all of our panelists, and any of all of you are also welcome back to have that conversation at length. But what advice would you give, particularly to aspiring creators, whether they're writers, illustrators, or whatnot, um, who would like to get noticed and make a living in the comic space? Hmm. Uh, making a living is the tricky part. Um, uh, I, I think the important thing for any creative person, and this applies to comics, is it's really important and it's almost paramount to move your goalposts. Like, do not set your sights on one goal. My goal for a long time was to become a full-time writer. When that didn't happen, I wanted to quit. I quit multiple times. And the one rule with being creative is you can't quit. Like if you quit, other people move on past you. So the only way that I didn't quit uh, and I still was excited about the work, about the creative process is I stopped thinking I needed to write full time. Once I moved that goalpost and I just need to keep making more books was the new goal. Then it was super fun. And I think that it's important for anybody to do that so you don't stop. And as far as getting noticed, I think if, if you have a feeling about something or you're uncomfortable, lean into that. Those, those are seeds are the ones that are gonna really take roots and are really gonna grow and people are gonna notice. Um, because if, if you don't, you know, it, sometimes the product ends up coming out like you try too hard or you just miss the mark. But if, you, if you're true to yourself, um, it, it resonates. And I think everybody on this panel has had that, that experience of writing something and then a reader coming to them and you're like, wow, it really touched them. I mean, the idea of someone coming up to me dressed as a character I created, that would be just wild. <laughs> so. Um, my, my advice for creators in really any medium is to come up with an idea for a project that has a lot for you to chew on and explore and set a, a manageable goal. And this is kind of piggybacking off of what Jeremy was saying, like set a manageable goal and then stay consistent with it over time. So like with my podcast, I was told by many people that if I ever wanted to make advertising revenue or like build a like patreon community with it that I like had to put out episodes once a week and I just knew that I didn't have the capacity to do that so I was like I'm gonna like feel really good about the episode that I put out once a month um and did like did that for years and then there would be times when I like had the capacity because of other things that I had going on in my hustle to like 
do more frequent episodes or like less frequent episodes. Um, but being able to do it consistently over many, many years, like makes me feel like it's doing what I want it to be doing and like connecting with people. And so I feel like there are so many platforms for that for you to like make your work and put it out there and like build an audience and I think that like you have to be like I know we were talking earlier about like confidence or like wondering like people like the thing that I do but like I personally feel like you got to be your own number one fan and, and part of it is like coming from punk culture and like this quote attributed to Richard Hell that like if you're not in your own favorite bands then what are you even doing and uh, like I, I I really do feel that way so I feel like especially if you're indie especially if you're doing it yourself like um build it build it slowly and consistently over uh time and it might take a long time so have something that you can depend on to make ends meet uh in the meantime and sooner or later you'll get there those are very very solid pieces of advice from both of you. You stole several things that I was going to say, so that's great. Um, you get going last, see? Yeah, I know, I know, I'm paying for it every time. Um, not learning either. Um, so I think that my piece of advice that I'll give, because we're all writers on this panel, um, which is pretty unique for a comics panel. Um, yeah. My piece of advice would be if you are doing any comics writing, including if you're an artist who is scripting your own comics, um, in addition to reading comics, like finished comics, um, read some scripts, um, like play scripts. There are some like, it's hard to get your hands on like actual comic scripts, but they're out there. Um, but I think that writing a script is a unique skill unto itself. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the more scripts you're reading, the more you like start to internalize the, the tricks of doing that. Um, so that's my piece of advice is read some scripts and do your best. And that's all you that's, can do. You that's, know? that's such great advice. And, and that's exactly what I did when I started out was I was able to find scripts from Jason Aaron and Joshua Dysart. They had them up on their websites and formats are very different in comics, which is interesting. Like it's not like mm -hmm. screenwriting. Uh, the format usually you will never see it. The only people who see it are the writer, the artist, and maybe an editor. But yeah, re like reading those scripts and then I would compare them to the comic page and, and it's like, you kind of see the, the, the mechanisms in place and you're like, oh, I see what, how they built this up to that page turn. It's like, oh, okay. but yeah, definitely reading scripts is good advice. Okay, so you're all coming back for a writing panel next too, because we definitely underrepresent writers and what we do and this would be amazing as well, but for our purposes today, um, let's get all of you, your socials and or websites, best places to find you basically. And also if you have anything that you wanna plug, it doesn't have to be comics related or teasers for anything upcoming, share them with us. And I think we should make Grace go first this time. What do you guys think? I'm happy to go yeah. first this time. <laughs> you, I mean, this is the easiest part. Sorry, my light, the, the sun has started coming directly into oh. it. Oh. That's why it's so crazy. I was it's seeing so like weird. a storm weird passing. Weird here now um so my you can find me on social media at grace c ls c is my middle initial stands for comics um <laughs> sorry um is my website is oh hey grace um i think my next big project coming out is a patricia highsmith biography comic it's coming out in february of next year it's it's a wild one nice i'm excited for it that's awesome. Oh, I'm excited for that too. Tina, while you're on, why, why not? So my website is tinahorn.net. That's T-I-N-A-H-O-R-N. And uh, there you can find out uh, uh, articles that I have written in, more about the books that I've written and edited, the nonfiction books that I've written and edited. And the workshops that I offer both in person and increasingly online because public space is all online now. Um, and more about my like consulting and coaching work, more about my website, why are people into that, which you can find wherever you pod. And 
you can buy Safe Sex Volume 1 Protection wherever fine books and comic books are sold. I certainly recommend that you either go to your local library or patronize your local book or comic book store. Um, I always recommend Blue Stockings, like I was talking about earlier. Um, they are in New York City, but they uh, ship everywhere in America. And we are, we meaning the Safe Sex Art Team, uh, ran a successful Kickstarter uh, a couple of months ago. And that was also really actually a great like a triumph to see like lots of people rallying around the book and like wanting more. Um, uh, so uh, with the budget that we got from that, we are working hard on safe sex terms of service, which is about, it's just a continuation of the same characters and story and world from safe sex protection. Um, but the big bads uh, of this book deal more with incels and sex robots. So mm. that's, that, that is all I will say for now on that. And that is gonna be out from Image in the fall. And you can find out more about that on uh, tinahorn.net or following me on Twitter and Instagram at T-I-N-A-H-R-N-S-A-S-S. -S. Oh, that's exciting. Um... Mine's pretty easy. It's just Jeremy Holt Books across the board, all social media. My website is jeremyholtbooks.com. And uh, I have my first prose novel coming out. Uh, I don't have a release date for it yet, but um, I've been told either in the winter or the spring of, of 2022. Cool. Yes, this has been amazing. Thank you all so much for being part of this. And I uh, just want to give a quick plug for Creators Assemble. You can visit us at creatorsassemble.org. Check out our limelight galleries of all the talent there. Discover new creators that are available for commissions and see our upcoming events and our educational resources for using comics in your classrooms and libraries. So with that, thank you again. You guys have been lovely. Thank Thanks. you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us.